India's classrooms overflow with aspirations, yet only 10% of working age women make it to the workforce. Barriers abound, but so do possibilities. Take a look at our next report as we explore the gender gap, the challenges and the path towards a just future for India's women. In the vibrant tapestry of India's socio-economic landscape, a stark reality persists. A report by the Centre for Monitoring the Indian Economy highlights significant disparity between women's enrollment in schools and their representation in the workforce. The report shows that only 10% of working-age Indian women were either employed or actively seeking jobs in 2022. That's despite women now having greater access to education across India. The ratio of female enrollment in primary education rose from 101.8% in 2018-19 to 104.8% in 2021-22. In upper primary education, this ratio rose from 87.74% in 2018 to 19 to 94.9% in 2021 22. But the rising enrollment ratio is not translating into greater workforce participation. In 2023, Men's workforce participation in India rose to 67%, while women's participation declined from approximately 36% in 2021 to slightly more than 33% in 2023. Experts note that women often face challenges securing jobs that demand hard skills. Moreover, several roles seek extended hours, night shifts or even extensive travel, putting millions of women at a disadvantage. Government policies promoting education, skill development, entrepreneurship, workplace inclusivity and childcare are essential to encourage more women to enter the workforce. As we turn our eyes towards Budget 2024, the question of women's workforce participation cannot be ignored. It's a golden opportunity to bridge the gap between education and employment, weaving policies that empower India's women. Bureau Report, Beyond World is One. And for more on how the government and the private sectors can help improve women's participation in India's workforce, we have with us Dr. Brinda Jagirdar, Senior Economist. She retired as Chief Economist, State Bank of India, and now serves on several corporate boards. And she's joining us live from Mumbai. Welcome to the broadcast, Doctor. Thank you. So my first question to you is that what are the reasons behind less women joining India's workforce despite access to education? Latest data suggests that only 10% Indian women are employed. You know, the numbers may differ, but what your report says that is factually quite true, that at the entry level you find maybe as many men as women who join the workforce, but as they progress in their career, uh, women tend to drop out more of much more than the men do. And uh, that is a problem. That That is an issue, definitely. Uh, now, why does this happen? That's because mainly women still have a large share of the family responsibilities, raising children, looking after the elderly in the family. And so, therefore, at some point, it is the women who step back. And perhaps that is getting reflected in the workforce. Now, if you look at the labor force participation uh, the, the survey which is put out by the NSSO periodically every quarter, it shows that the workforce participation of uh, the labor force participation of women uh, has gone up and gone up much more than the men. And similarly, the unemployment rate has come down much faster in the case of women than in the case of men. So therefore, we see that some changes are happening. And if you look at the Republic Day Parade you can see that it was a real a show mm. of women empowerment, women in every sphere of the activity, economic activity, every sphere, cultural, economic. Uh, and it's really heartening that women are there in the armed forces also, in the DRDO, scientific, moon mission. Uh, I mean, they're there everywhere. Mm. Uh, so therefore, uh, it, the situation definitely is changing. So I mm. think we need a different survey to capture this change. Mm. For example, when the uh, index of industrial production, mm. a few years ago, it was seen that industry seems to be producing more, but it is not getting reflected in the IIP index. Mm. So therefore, it was uh, the base year was changed, the classification weightages were changed because they found 
that the items that were included in the IIP were things like typewriters, which were not manufactured anymore. And so these were removed and uh, things like the set-top boxes, etc., right. were included. So I think it's time now for us to really look at how we measure the labor force. Now, for example, I feel that this is highly biased in favor of manufacturing. Hmm. But India is a largely um, services-driven society. And so, therefore, we need to capture this. And also, there is uh, the gig economy that is taking place and uh, the social sector, which is very, very active. Now, I know people who have quit corporate jobs and taken on influencers' jobs in social sector, right. in social media. They're earning very well. So, we need to see how uh, and contract labor is going up. So this has to be captured in the uh, data. So I'm not too convinced that the CMI data is the last word, but we need to see how we change our methodology to capture the change in society. Right, Dr. Jagidar, you speak of how as women progress in the career, they tend to drop out. Uh, my second question is just a follow-up on that statement, that what steps have or could the government actually take to bridge the gender gap in the workforce? Um, yes, uh, uh, some of it is uh, something which the women themselves have to come forward and take. Like, for example, they need to upskill themselves. They need to be up to date in uh, their work and uh, they need to be uh, willing to take on more responsibilities and move out to different uh, cities or maybe different areas or wherever. So I think the commit that, that is required. Uh, but it's difficult because, like I said, you need family support, you need daycare. So if the corporates can step in and bridge this gap, so if they can provide them, say, flexible working hours, uh, work from home options or uh, daycare uh, facilities, so this will really help. And of course, leave, sabbatical leave in between. And uh, parental leave may be when required, maybe even in different, at different stages of their career. In the initial years, it would be for child rearing. And as they go on, maybe it is for care of the elderly, the in-laws, the parents. So let the women be given an opportunity to take leave at different aspects, at different uh, times in their uh, career. And it's interesting that some corporates are really looking at returning mothers, you know, how to employ, how to take back these women who were really very, very successful in their career, but had to drop out for some reason. And now they are ready. The children have grown. They've gone, they're going to full-time school. And the women are ready to come back to the workforce. So there are some corporates I know who are making special uh, space for such returning mothers. So if the corporates themselves also can uh, be more proactive, hmm. uh, then I think, and because there's no way India can become a $5 trillion economy hmm. it, by ignoring such a large chunk of its workforce so it has to be inclusive it has to take the women into the workforce and make sure that they retain them so uh, the corporates have to be proactive and the the participants themselves have mm. to take the decision absolutely and i tell you just one more point because uh, like you said in your um, report that uh, this the, the share of uh, the enrollment is very high, but the labor force is very low. But so the enrollment, high enrollment ratio will start getting reflected in the employment uh, figures, uh, say a decade later. And at that time, if there are not enough support systems available, hmm. uh, Gen Z may just decide not to have children. So, and we don't want such a society. Right, Dr. Jagirdar, thank you so much for joining us here on Beyond and sharing insights with us on this. Thank you.